Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Redneckologist Show. I'm Spur. And I'm Coot. And this is show number three. And this is going to be a part of our Southern Cooking segment. And today we're going to be talking about fish. Good old fish, if it's fried. I love fried fish. Oh, yeah, fried fish. Uh, Now, if I'm at a restaurant, I like uh, the pan seared and stuff like that every once in a while, but... For at home, for the fresh freshwater fish, I like fried. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and blackened. Blackened is good if you're going to pan fry it. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's good as well. What, so when we talk about fish, let's tell them what we're talking about, Coop. We're talking about freshwater fish here. That means anything you can go out and catch in the lake yourself. And we will go saltwater fishing if we get the opportunity. We went one time. We didn't have much luck at it. Uh, That's not what we're skilled in. I grew up fishing for freshwater fish in the backwaters and around uh, the rivers and stuff. and, And that's what I know how to go get. Might as well go ahead and tell them it's the Arkansas River. Yeah, that. And and we've done some fishing around Texas and and other areas. But yeah, the freshwater fish. But my favorite one to eat as a fillet is crop. Yeah, it it. And I think most of the people out there would agree that you know unless there's something wrong with you. Uh, crappie is usually the the most tastiest fish now as far as the fish go i prefer to catch bass and i do enjoy uh fried fried bass now if you cook crappie and bass together and you gave me a piece of crappie and a piece of bass i think i could tell you the difference yeah a lot of these bass anglers they they get upset with you if you bring them bass in and and you know play them out and eat them they won't put them back and let them grow so they can I guess brag on how big a fish they caught. I guess. See, being a redneck, I, I'm going fishing for a purpose. I'm not going fishing for bragging rights. I'm going fishing to have something to eat. Yeah, we're going out there to catch something to eat. Now, when I was a kid, we would go crappie fishing, and it I mean, it was a whole family. And Mama would take a skillet, grease. She would take meal, and usually... Uh, light bread what we call light bread is a loaf of uh, sunbeam bread or whatever and we would catch those fish and we would uh, take a spoon and we would go from the tail toward the head and rake all the scales off of the crappie and we would open them up cut their heads off take the the entrails out and fry those dudes just like that whole crappie just like that now, all I know is the best way to do them is with a fillet knife, uh, especially an electric knife. And, uh, you know, I, I've gotten used to eating those fillets, and I remember it hadn't been too long ago, I don't know where I was, but somebody had some crappie fried up, and it was a whole fish. And when I broke into that thing, it just it didn't smell right. It, it, it didn't taste as good as the fillets. Right, I agree with that. Now, I haven't had the pleasure or displeasure or whatnot of having a whole fried crappie. I have had brim that way, the smaller sunfish, and and we uh, took a spoon and and raked the scales off of them and and cooked them whole like that. But uh, I haven't had crappie that way. I don't think I'd want to mess up a crappie like that. No, especially if it's a bigger fish. And what you do when you cut that fillet out, it eliminates all those little backbones and little bones up the belly side of the fish, you can take that fillet on a pound to a pound and a half crappie, fillet it out, and fillet it off of that skin, and then you can start right around the upper end of those ribs, and you can just take a a sharp knife or that same fillet knife and just follow the contour of those ribs, and you've got wall-to-wall meat. Yeah, no bones. And every once in a while, you may get a little bone in there, but mostly it's boneless. Now, we've done uh, brim like that before, uh, hybrid brim. They're real thick fillets. Uh, Some people call them red ear brim because they have that red dot uh, on the side of their head. But you have to catch a big one in order to get a good-sized fillet out of it. Uh, But that's my favorite way to do it is just to to do those boneless fillets. And uh, what about catfish? Catfish is another story because he's covered with skin and if it's a four to four and a half pound or smaller 
if I can get my big old hand around his head and make those vertical cuts down each side of that fin that sticks up on his back, then you can come down from that point, the point toward his head, and go down to just behind his gills on each side. Then when you take that fish skinner and catch that point on there and you start pulling, oh, it's going to rip off and you'll have to go back and get you another hold on it. But when you get to pulling all that skin off, then you take his head off, and after you take his head off and the insides out of him, you know, you open those belly pieces up. And when you go to the store and Walmart, whoever's got this big bag of, what do they call them, catfish nuggets? Yeah. That's what they're talking about. Most of it is that belly flab on each side of where those entrails were at, and it's all covered with this black stuff. Even when you buy those things out of the store, you need to get each and every one of them under a faucet and keep rubbing and run a little water and rub until you get that black off there. If you don't, it's going to taste bad. Yeah, now I know so I've talked to some guys before, and, and they, they actually liked more of the gray or black or whatever left on there, but I, I don't. It's just it's too strong. Now, these catfish I'm talking about, if they're uh, seven, eight plus pound fish, I have to hang them up, you know, put a big hook in their lip, hang them from a two by four or whatever. Do the same cuts, and basically you skin them out the same way, but they're just so big I can't hold them. Yeah, and that's true. And depending on the size of the fillet, uh, for crappie and bass and brim and things like that, we usually leave the fillet whole. Smaller catfish, we'd leave that fillet whole as well. Uh, but on bigger ones, I, I would suggest cutting them down, especially if you're going to mix it with smaller fillets or uh, try to cook all of your big batter chunks together. And we'll talk about the cooking method here in a minute, but because you don't want little thin fillets in with big chunks in your oil. Yeah, and that, that's another point. I'm glad you brought that up about the catfish fillets. Now, when you get through skinning this dude out and you pull that belly, I call it the belly fin, you can catch it back toward his tail with those skinners and just pull forward and that whole thing will rip out. And then you can take your fillet knife, even though it's, it doesn't have a head, you know, all of his insides are out. You can start at that tail and come up until you hit that first rib. And then I take my fillet knife and go straight down. Well, that's one fillet, and I flip him over, and I start at that tail, and I come up to that first rib, and I cut down. That's another fillet. Then you can take those nugget pieces off we were talking about. Then you can turn him back up on his belly side of him and go right down, right on each side of his backbone or where that fin used to be sticking up you can go straight down and just follow those ribs around and you get two more fillets yeah yeah you get a lot off that and and catfishing for me uh, a lot of times it's a, it's an easier uh, go of fishing you know if we're tired or whatever you can always just throw a line out in the water you're just waiting on a bite yeah unless they're really biting good they you know they don't wear you out like that moving around and hunting them and find, trying to find them yeah, anchor down instead of burning that trolling motor battery up. And your largemouth bass, the white bass, and like Spur said a while ago, even your bigger brim, they all fillet out basically the same. You start right behind that little fin on the side, and you kind of cut in toward their head and flip your knife around and follow that backbone but don't cut plumb out now you leave a little strip of that skin holding that piece of that tail you can take your knife and flip it out and just it looks like one continual stroke and you just come out with that that meat and then you cut those ribs out and you got all meat yeah and and so now we've talked about getting a fillet so we have our fillet and we've talked a little bit about bigger pieces and smaller pieces and I can tell you what, being redneck, if if I had a bag of crappie, a bag of catfish, and a bag of bass, and I wanted a fish fry, I'd fry them all up together. Uh, I wouldn't fry them all at the same exact time, but I may separate them into different pans, but I guarantee you we'd eat them all. But uh, regardless of what we fillets we have, I like doing a buttermilk soak on them. Yes, sir, buttermilk. Yeah, and I'll take a bowl uh, you know, a pint, a couple of pints of buttermilk, and uh, put them in the, in the bowl, get that buttermilk covering them up, mix them around a little bit. And I like to wait about 15 to 20 minutes before I start frying them. Yeah, out. let them in, enzymes start working. 
Yeah, and I don't know the science behind it, but I know it sure does taste good. Yeah, and it, uh, it even when you pull it out and roll it in that meal, then that meal sticks to that fish uh, much thicker. Oh, yeah, and let's talk about that meal because, so now we got our fish soaking in the buttermilk, and so I have a picture up here showing all the steps, but I'm going to go through it, and we like the cornmeal, and, and any southern person's going to like the cornmeal fried fish. I do put some flour in it, but I put a more corn, little more cornmeal than flour. So if you're going to talk about half and half of cornmeal flour, it's more cornmeal and less flour. But in that, I like to pour, and, and I don't measure, but it turns out good every time. But um, I pour a reasonable amount of garlic powder, and that's just a regular old granulated garlic powder. And then I take a seasoned salt. And I put just as much seasoned salt as I did the garlic powder. If you like less garlic, put a little less garlic in there. Uh, But I tell you what, people just rave over this fish when we cook it. Yeah, me and mom at home just cooking a few pieces in the the fry daddy or whatever, little electric fryer. Uh, We have even uh, take uh, a little bit of uh, cayenne pepper. Now that's you know each each to their own, but to me that's that's really a good flavor. Yeah, and it is. But uh, you have to remember a lot of times when we're doing it, uh, we have kids around. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to burn the kids up. And if we did that, I mean, I could do it, but I'd have to do it in different batches and have a kid-friendly batch and then a cayenne pepper batch and even some of these adults around here they're not going to like that cayenne yeah them beer drinkers batch yeah yeah that's what it is so we got the seasoning and i just mix that right in with the flour and cornmeal get it all mixed up real good and we have a shaker basket it's a plastic uh, tub with a it's two actually two plastic tubs and the middle divider is has holes in it it's like a mesh but it's a large hole uh, mesh thing and you put the fish in there uh and, and you shake it around i don't remember where we got that thing it must have been a, a tupperware thing yeah i think you can probably order them I, i've seen them though at uh some of these box stores these sports sporting good box stores uh around the uh, cajun stuff around the the outdoor cooking stuff Oh, I, we've done chicken and all in there too i mean it's not just for fish but anyway back to the subject all right, so we get them coated. Now, I like coating just as much fish as I'm going to drop at that moment. I don't like getting ahead of it because it'll, they'll lay there and get gummy. And so we have our oil ready. So before we throw fish, we have the seasoning ready. We have the fillets all ready. They're soaking in buttermilk. And then we get our turkey fryers going. Depending on how many people we're going to have, we may have two or three of those turkey fryers going. Right. And I like to use the lower pots, not the big turkey fryer pot, but the, the, a lot of times they'll come with two sizes. And that lower pot has a basket that'll drop down in it, and I like using that. Yeah, I call that the fish fryer pot. Yeah, and it's important to not put your fish in your basket and then put it in the oil. You want your basket, it's only for getting the fish out. Putting them in, you want that basket down in there because if you put the fish in the basket and then lower it, they're going to stick to that basket. All right, now we'll talk about the cooking part of it. Uh, what temperature do you like? In a perfect world, if I had a regulator or a thermo- you know, a thermostat on the thing that would maintain a temperature, I like 325. Well, I got a little story I want to tell, and then I'll hush, and we'll get back to, to the main drag. But I was at my grandma and grandpa's house one day, and my great aunt and great uncle came by, and he had some catfish to cook. So they go into the kitchen, and he gets a skillet. And, of course, we didn't use cooking oil back then. He, you know, took some lard and put over in that skillet. And he started melting that lard, and he said, that grease ain't hot enough. And he kept saying, that grease ain't hot enough. And I said, well, Uncle, how in the world are you going to know? And he said, let me give you, let me show you something. And he took a match, an unstruck match, dropped it into that skillet and that I said what's going to happen he said well when that match head goes off that grease will be just right for frying fish and sure enough all of a sudden that match head just like he struck it and he reached in and dipped that match stick out started laying the fish in there hmm. 
I don't know. I use a thermometer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way. But I just thought I'd throw that little little bit little bit of story in here. Yeah, I've never tried that. That's interesting. I, uh, hmm, I I guess that might work. Put your basket down in the oil, and what do we use usually? Canola, canola, or whatever. Whatever. A lot of people like peanut oil. It's so expensive, and if I was gonna cook a hundred, you know, like a hundred pounds of fish. Yeah, I, I would probably want three cookers with peanut oil because it do, it don't burn as bad. I mean, it, this old canola oil, if you're cooking for a fish fry, some of that will get pretty dark before you get through. Now, the fish tastes just as good, but it will get dark. That peanut oil, it'll cook longer at a higher temperature or whatever without doing that. Yeah, and a lot of, most of the time, if I'm going to cook something hotter, I'll want peanut oil because uh, it, it will burn or it will cook at a hotter temperature without smoking. Now, when you stick your, your basket down in the oil and you start laying your catfish or crappie or whatever in, all right, fish, I guess, is probably like us. It's more water than anything. But when you start laying that fish into that hot grease and you see all these old white bubbles and that you know frying sound and everything you can't see what's going on in that pan but if you just leave that fish alone the rule of thumb is with catfish crappie just about any kind of fish you cook when that fish floats it's done now my question is when it floats is it as brown as you want it to be or as golden brown exactly and that's what your cooking temp's going to have a lot to do with that now what you don't want is for that cooking temp to be too hot, and then it, by the time it floats, it's really dark. Unless you like it really dark, but I like it a golden brown. It's hard to keep that temperature right because you're constantly taking out done fish. All right, you've got cold fish over here soaking in buttermilk, being wrapped in your meal and all, and as soon as that fresh fish hits that grease, the temperature is going to go down. I guess ideally, the, the ideal thing would be if, if as soon as that fish floats, if it's as brown as you want it, take it out. But usually on these fish fries and things, I'll leave that fish in there, keep an eye on it, take my fork or whatever and push it around, maybe raise it up and look at the other side. When it gets brown like I like it or like most people like it, I pick that basket up and get it out of there. Yeah, and he's not talking about 15 minutes or anything, just a, a, a few seconds or half a minute or whatever longer than the float on it. And if, if it's floating too quick uh, and it's not brown enough, just turn your heat up just a little bit, uh, raise that temperature up. I like to shoot for around uh, the three teens on the temp uh, and then start cooking because that temperature is just keeping going up and up and up on that oil. And I don't like breaking between batches of fish. So I like getting one in, get it out, get another one in, get it out. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we're smoking. We got to turn this thing down a little. And then I regulate. And I like doing several batches of fish before I have to re-regulate my oil. I seem to always jump the gun. And as far as I know, it doesn't hurt. But I have always looked at that oil and think, boy, that oil ought to be hot. And I'll lay a piece of fish in there, and that thing just kind of floats around in one or two little old bubbles. See, I didn't let my grease get hot enough. And, and there's a method on that. Uh, one, the thermometer is, is a good method. It, once, it, once it gets up over 300, it's going to fry that fish. Oh, know? yeah. 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 Uh, so that's, that's your safest way. Uh, but another way, if you don't have a thermometer, uh, is you can put, now don't go overboard with this, but put one tiny drop of water in that oil. And if it doesn't, sound off for you it's not ready and when that water starts making that tinking sound in that pot oh it'll sound like a chicken cackling and carrying oh on. yeah <laughs> then your oil's ready yeah how many people out there like hush puppies Ooh, i know i do and i'm gonna tell you what i've i've had some good ones bought out of the bags i mean you can go to your grocery store and go to the, the, the fish section and all and different places have different brands of hush puppies i haven't met one yet that i don't like now some of these restaurants around here when you order hush puppies they look more like your little finger they're rolled out and a little they're they're cornbread if that's what you want i mean they're hush puppies but I don't know, just uh, they don't quite have the flavor. But I'm telling you what, I've eaten some good homemade hush puppies here lately. 
Oh, yeah. And I, and I like putting all kind of stuff in my hush puppies. I like corn. And my favorite now, if you want to go all out, talking about gourmet redneck, you get fresh corn, you fire your grill or your outdoor cooker up, and you pull those husks down, not off. You, you get the silks off, put your husk back on, and then roll it around on that grill for a while and, and roast that corn on there and then cut it off with a knife and use that to go in your hush puppies. And whoever's there, if you're single, somebody's going to want to marry you that night. Well, I've never had any like that yet. You holding out on me. Well, I, it's a lot of trouble. And you know, so uh, I don't normally do that. I've done it before. Uh, it's a lot It's a lot of mess to go through. But I like putting jalapenos in it when I do that. It's like a more of a Southwest type hush puppy. Uh, I like onion. I like chopped up onion in it. Uh, and I'll put all that stuff in there raw. Mostly what I do around here is just that frozen corn. And I'll thaw it out. And I'll mix it in with the batter along with the white onion, uh, put a little cheddar cheese in there. If the kids are going to be eating them, uh, I still put jalapenos in, but I take the seeds out. I've always thought that the hush puppy batter had to be pretty thick to uh, make a hush puppy, uh, you know, how they make these little balls. But I'm going to tell you what, these hush puppies that Old Spur makes, they are really good. I guess they, you, you got flour in them? Uh, yeah, I do. I make a uh, sort of a corn... Uh, bread muffin uh, mixture uh, you know and you can put so you can put more or less dry ingredients to, to wet ingredients and have a denser one you can put more cornmeal than flour and have a more cornbread dense uh, hush puppy or you can make a cornbread muffin type fluffy mixture and, and they'll swell out there and, and, and be kind of soft but I like the softer ones better when I'm putting all that stuff in the middle yeah and what I was talking about uh, being you, you, you really want them, that batter to be solid enough because the way you do these things, you take that pan of batter and you take two, what do you call them? Uh, I'll, we always called them big spoon, but they're, they're a soup spoon like you eat soup with at home. You take two of those and you dip up some of that batter in that and you want it to lay in that spoon pretty good. And you hold that spoon down close to that grease and you take that other spoon and you just push that batter out of there into that hot grease. It gives them all a, a unique shape, but they're all shaped about the same. And you think, uh, no more than that is, that thing ain't going to be very big, but that thing will swell up there twice as big as a golf ball. Yeah, and they're good, too. Uh, now, the other thing I like to do is uh, potatoes or taters. Oh, you can't have fish fry without hush puppies and taters. Yeah, taters. Now, there's a couple of ways. Uh, last time we did it, we had a lot of people coming. And I didn't want to spend a lot of time prepping, so we just bought steak fries in the frozen in the bag, and we just kind of fried those to have them on the side. But if I'm doing it for a more intimate affair, put it that way, with with the close friends, I'll take potato bag potatoes and I'll just chop them up into big cubes. Yeah, and if you happen to have a little heart problem or something, and you can't eat that much fried stuff. You can take a regular old potato and cut it out into wedges, and you can. Uh, drizzle just a little bit of olive oil and you can sprinkle a little season on there that season oil or whatever and put them on a biscuit pan or a baking sheet with tin foil on it shove that thing into the oven and let them taters brown up in that oven oh they're good yeah they are now the what other things are we missing here so we've got the fish done we have the hush puppies done and we have the potatoes done the kids they like ketchup but uh, I like tartar sauce. Tartar sauce. And I like Cajun Chef or Louisiana hot sauce mixed in with my tartar sauce. One more thing on, on this, and this is just a thought and an idea. I've done it before. It works real good. But if you think you're running short on, uh, say, hush puppies or something like that, have you a can of those uh, little old, they're just a little old bitty small can of biscuits and try opening a can of those up and drop them dudes in that grease now you want your grease to cool down a little bit after you cook your fish and your potatoes float those biscuits on there and you can take a spoon or a fork and you can raise that ball of dough up and when it gets like you want it on that bottom side in other words when it gets brown and it's pretty just give it a little 
flip and that thing will just roll over and that brown side will be up and that dough side will be down and you'll think oh those things are going to just be soaked in oil but they're not they're no. dry and good and crispy yeah the biscuits he's talking about i call it well they're the cheap cheapest biscuits you can get and they usually come i've seen them a lot of times in a blue can or a red can yeah and a little four pack yeah, yeah, the little four pack. That's used to little... get the whole thing for forty cents, but I don't know what they are now. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, yeah, I I don't remember. I, I like also like using those uh, for dumplings. I know some people would shoot me if I said that, but uh, if I'm doing just quick chicken and dumplings, I'll I'll take those little cheap biscuits I call them, and I cut them into fourths, and then I drop those little quarters in there. Yeah, when I'm eating my fish, I'll get my plate. I'll get two or three, four pieces of fish. I'll get me a couple of hush puppies. I'll get me some of them taters. But, man, I love a dill pickle and some sliced up. And I prefer the red or the purple onion. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, you take a bite of onion after biting that fish. Oh, it's that cold onion and that hot fish. And then that drink of beer. Oh, yeah, and wash it down. Well, I think we're kind of running out of time here. I want to keep this uh, show to a reasonable time frame. But if you have any questions, uh, just hit us down in the comment section. We also have a discussion tab on our channel. Uh, You can see it up at the top of the video page. You can enter a discussion in there if you want to talk about stuff. Let us know what you've done. Let us know if we've said anything that you don't agree with. And and we might learn something. But for right now, uh, that's going to end this show. Uh, I'm Spur. And I'm Coot. And please subscribe.